Good afternoon and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. In today's news, SpaceX makes an extremely good hiring decision that is likely to have very positive impacts on the future of their human landing system, that is to say the Lunar Starship, and any other crewed space flight that they have in mind for Starship in the future. And on the other side of the Atlantic, the European Space Agency, after some hand-wringing and extremely anxious few days, manages to get the Juice probe operational. An extremely key instrument was rendered inactive and useless because an antenna would not properly deploy. However, the European Space Agency always expressed confidence that they would be able to restore service to the damaged probe, and sure enough, they managed to accomplish this. But how was it done? How did they manage to fix something from a million miles away? This and more on the Angry Astronaut Bulletin. Also, a quick reminder, I am now two-thirds of the way, actually more than two-thirds of the way, to my short-term goal of being able to move across the Atlantic. Short-term revenue goal, that is, and I wouldn't have been able to do it, obviously, without your amazing and generous support. Thank you so much. If you would like to support my effort and get me the rest of the way down the hill, please check out my GoFundMe page and contribute, or you can also contribute to my PayPal and Patreon. Let's move on with the news today. The Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or the Juice Probe, is back on course, and no doubt there are many people breathing a lot easier at the European Space Agency, because this probe is one of the most ambitious things that the Europeans have ever done. To give you an impression of just how ambitious this probe actually is, the Voyager 1 probe had a launch mass of 721.9 kilograms, whereas the the Juice Probe has a mass of over six metric tons. We're talking eight times as big and absolutely loaded with scientific equipment. This was not only a difficult probe to design, to engineer, to build, but also to launch. Something this heavy is beyond the capability of just about every operational rocket with the exception of the Ariane 5. Yes, the Falcon Heavy could launch something like this, as well, but the Falcon Heavy was not a mature system when Juice was being designed. And also, the Atlas series was completely booked. Only the Ariane 5 could handle this probe, and it handled it beautifully. However, shortly after the probe was launched, it began to experience problems with its most important piece of scientific equipment. Incidentally, if you'd like to learn more about Juice's complete mission and the description of everything that's on this probe, I have a video linked at the end of this one. Now, 10 out of the probe's 11 instruments functioned just fine. However, the most important piece of equipment arguably on the probe, the Radar for Icy Moons Exploration or RIME antenna, failed to deploy properly. It was jammed in its mounting bracket because of a loose pin, apparently. Now, according to ESA officials at the time, they had a variety of different steps that would be necessary in order to try to jar the entire structure loose. However, after days of attempting to do so, ESA was met with failure. It was a frustrating problem to say the least because all ESA engineers had to do was jar this pin loose by a couple of millimeters in order to get the antenna to deploy properly. However, as I said, they had a very difficult time accomplishing this in spite of the fact that they tried a variety of different tricks to loosen the pin including vibrating juice using its thrusters and also changing the orientation of the spacecraft so the pin would be warmed by sunlight. Nothing worked. And then finally, by utilizing what's called a non-explosive actuator, which was a shock delivered by another one of juice's scientific instruments, they finally managed to move the pin sufficiently to free the antenna. That being the case then, juice now has the ability to scan 
beneath the surface of Jupiter's moons to a depth of over 9 kilometers, giving us our first picture of the inside of these moons and the subsurface oceans that almost certainly exist beneath them. Once we have a better picture of what's beneath the surface of Jupiter's moons, we'll have a better idea of just how suitable they are for harboring the first life that we may discover in the solar system. A very important development on this probe that is now over a million miles away from our planet. And in an equally exciting development, SpaceX has made the decision to hire Kathy Leaders as their general manager out at their Starbase facility in Texas, reporting directly to SpaceX President and COO Gwen Shotwell. This is a very good move in my opinion because Kathy Leaders has headed up some of the most important recent projects for human spaceflight at NASA. She was the manager of the commercial crew program when SpaceX launched the Crew Dragon Demo 2 mission on May 30th of 2020, and she became the head of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate on June 12th of 2020, appointed to this position by Jim Bridenstine, the first woman in that position. On top of that, she was also one of the key people to make the decision to go with Lunar Starship. Although she did not make the recommendations herself, she was one of the key decision makers in the selection process for HLS and expressed a great deal of personal confidence in the Lunar Starship system as being the best solution for landing human beings on the surface of the moon in the near future. Although I don't really agree with her assessment and feel that a system like Alpaca is far more likely to be able to successfully scout the surface of the moon in the short term than a complex system like Starship, I am very reassured to see that she is taking personal responsibility of this project after having endorsed it at NASA. I think that this is a very good move on SpaceX's part to get somebody with this kind of experience in human spaceflight engaged with Lunar Starship, especially given the fact that they have to somehow land a starship on the surface of the moon in the next two to three years if Artemis is to stay on track. If there's anybody who can manage to accomplish this, I would say it would be Kathy Leaders. On top of that, she doesn't strike me as the kind of person who's looking to anchor herself to a sinking ship, so this indicates to me that she has a great deal of personal confidence in the success of the project. That being the case, though, I would also like to see a little bit more transparency in HLS and Lunar Starship in the near future, given how much Artemis really depends on it. The NASA Office of Inspector General, in my opinion, should begin an investigation into HLS to determine just when it will be realistically expected to land human beings on the moon, because in my opinion, it has a very tall hill to climb. We have to master Starship's launch process, we have to master low Earth orbit refueling, and we have to master Starship's landing procedure on the surface of the moon. Oh yeah, and also get Starship to the point to where it can safely and reliably dock either with Orion or the Lunar Gateway in lunar orbit. All of these things are going to be extremely difficult challenges, one that I think Kathy Leaders is very well suited to head up, but at the same time, it would be nice to see some transparency in the program, as we have seen with SLS and other aspects of Artemis, to reassure the American tax Payer that we are likely to land on the moon at least by 2026, if not sooner. Kathy Leaders has a tough job ahead of her, but it's not the first time. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, and also please hit those notification bells so you can be notified every time I release a video, as opposed to when YouTube thinks you should be notified about it. And as always, stay angry about space.